Hello students, welcome to my web development course. I hope you're all ready to start coding and building beautiful websites. The course is basically divided into four sections. We'll be covering different topics related to web development. The first section is going to be an introduction to some fundamental concepts of web development. Uh, in this video, we are going to talk about how we'll proceed with the course. So as we proceed further, we'll be building a course website itself with the things that we learn along the way. By the end of the course, we'll have a finished course website with us and we'll also learn how to host it online. This is what the course website is going to look like when we start. Here's the first section that we are going to cover now and under this first section is the first topic that we are going through. I believe this will be a great way to introduce you guys to web development as we'll have all the practical understanding and as soon as you complete this course, you can go ahead and start making your own websites. By the end of the last class, when we have added design and interaction to our pages, this is what our course website will look like. It looks good, isn't it? And believe it or not, you will be easily able to build websites like these after the course is completed. Hello students. Today we are going to cover a very basic topic related to our course. If we are learning web development, the first thing that we ought to know is what is web development? Sounds kind of stupid, I know, as many of you might be aware of it already, but still I'll cover just to be sure that we are on the same page before we start learning it. So as you can see here, as per Wikipedia, web development is the work involved in developing a website for the internet, World Wide Web, or an internet that is a private network. Internet is basically what you visit when you enter a website on your browser using www. On the other hand, internet is a private network which is not accessible on World Wide Web and its access is only limited to certain individuals. Uh, let's say a big company might have its own private network for its employees, so on and so forth. And uh, okay students, so a few of you might be thinking that these kinds of technical definitions are quite boring and this is not what you signed up for. Just bear with me in this section and I promise you that from next section, that is HTML onwards, it's only going to be action. Very less theory and more fun by making things. But let's hold on for some time and get our basics clear in this short introductory session. So coming back to the definition of web development, when you create a website for either internet or intranet, which can be visited by people using a tool like browser, the entire process of building such a website is called web development. I hope that's clear for all of us now. Uh, so see you in next chapter. Bye-bye. Hi students. I'm back today with another very basic concept. Today, we'll understand what are servers. Very often, you must hear about big companies like Google having a lot of servers or when a big website goes down due to some form of server malfunction. So, in its essence, what are these servers? As you can read here, a server is nothing but a computer program or a device that provides functionality for other programs or devices called clients. And this architecture is called the client-server model. Keep this model in mind as we'll, take, as we'll talk a bit more about it again. Uh, basically, server is a destination where your website is kept for people to access. Even your laptop can be a server if your website is stored there, but often we buy it from server companies because for our website to be accessible at all times, the server should be on and connected to the internet at all times. Okay students, now coming back to the client server model that I mentioned before, in the next chapters and section throughout, we'll very often use this word called client. And so it is very important to understand what it means. A client is nothing but you or more specifically your computer or your browser which sends requests on your behalf to the server. And the server, which as we read in the definition before, is a computer program or a hardware device that responds to such requests. This entire interaction and the relation between the client and server is called the client-server model. As we'll progress in the field of web development, you will very often read about this relationship in technical articles, so it would be very beneficial if you understand it right now. I think that should make it clear to you guys what is a server 
and what client server model is. In the next chapter, we'll cover a little more about this client server model and see what kind of activities happen on the server end and on the client end. See you in our next session. Welcome back students. We left the previous chapter while we talked about servers and I introduced you to the client server model. In this session, I'll delve a little deep into this. In the client server model, there are certain things that happen on the server side and certain things that take place on the client side. Based on our last lecture, I hope you follow when I say server and client side. If you don't, please go back and take the last lecture again. For the certain things that happen on the server side, we write server side code and for things that happen on the client side, we write client side code. We'll understand a bit about this now. So as you can see, server side scripting is a technique used in web development which involves employing scripts on a web server which produce a response customized for each user's user which is also called as client's request to the website. Take the example of Facebook. If you and one of your friends are logged into Facebook, when you both open facebook.com, different web page with different content, that is news feed in Facebook's case, opens up. This means that the server of Facebook has customized the page based on the user which is accessing it. It is one of the examples of what happens on the server side. Once the server side creates the code for the web page, it sends the same to the client and the browser starts building the web page based on that code. Now coming to the definition, program that runs on the client machine or browser and deals with the user interface or display and any other processing that can happen on client's machine like reading slash writing cookies actually forms the client side code. So basically, as you can see from our Facebook example, there are a few things that are happening on the server side and a few things that are happening on the client side. Server is creating custom web pages for different users and is sending it to the client. Whereas the client takes that code and builds a web page out of it. The code which goes to the client and on the basis of which the client makes the display of the page is called client side code. In this course, we are mostly going to cover client side code as HTML, CSS and JavaScript which we are going to talk about are mostly used for that purpose. And these are the most basic requirement for building a website. If you want to read more about client server model, although not required for this course, you just do a simple Google search and you will find tons of articles about it. But if you find it difficult to understand about this client server model, you can listen to this lecture again. And if you still find it confusing, then just follow along with this course and it will become clear to you when we start writing client side code. So, Hope to see you again in the next session. Hello students. So here's a good news for you. We are down to our last chapter in this theoretical section and we are going to start building web pages from next section onwards. To start building web pages, we have a prerequisite. You need to have a good code editor. Before I suggest one to you, here is what code editors mean. It is a text editor program designed specifically for editing source code of computer programs. You might think, why do you need one? Like Microsoft Word, which comes with assistance in form of spell check and other things to help you write essays or letters, code editors too come with lot of assistance that helps you in writing code, such as autocomplete suggestions, finding bugs, or missing things like parentheses in your code that can become quite tedious. All in all, it becomes really easy to write code with a good code editor program. There are many text editors you can use, such as Sublime Text, Notepad++, Atom, etc. I'll be using Sublime Text for this course, which looks like this. Um, I'll open it for you here. So it would be recommended to use that because it would be then a little easier for you to follow along. But for all practical purposes, you can use a code editor that you want. So students, make sure you download a code editor and install it before the next section where we'll start building web pages. See you soon. Hello students, I hope you guys are all pumped up now because from here onwards, we have started HTML section and it's going to be more about coding now and less boring theories. So getting back to the website that I was showing to you guys in the previous Intro to Web Development section, we have now come to the HTML Creating Web Pages section. So I'll click on it. 
And now we are on the first chapter, which is using tools in Chrome. So students, I'm sure you must have used browsers to visit different websites like this Chrome browser, or you may have used Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, just to name a few. Most of these browsers, apart from helping you visit websites, which is their primary role, also come with a few tools that helps you to explore the HTML and CSS of a web page. So to do that, I'll just click on, right click on this page and go on inspect. So this particular black box comes up and if you see over here on the left hand side, the entire HTML markup of this page is being shown. And on the right side, the CSS or design of this page is being shown. So we'll be covering the CSS in further sections. For now, we'll keep our focus on the HTML side of things. So as you can see over here, if I just close these arrow buttons, you can see what this basic web page looks like. It has a doc type HTML tag, which defines the document type of this page, that is HTML. There's an opening HTML tag, closing HTML tag, a head tag, and a body tag. Um, you need not be confused with these tags right now because we'll be covering them in further chapters. The purpose of this chapter is to only introduce you to this inspect tool in Chrome so that when I start using it while designing websites from next chapter onwards, you feel comfortable with it. So students, if I want to see the HTML for a particular element on this page, I'll click on this arrow button and I'll go and select that particular element on the page. And as you can see, this line has been highlighted over here, which is HTML topics to cover under the H2 tag. Let's say if I want to edit this content uh, just to change the look on this web page, whatever I write over here gets reflected on the web page itself. So I hope you understand uh, how to use this inspect tool in Chrome now. Uh, students, I would suggest you to go on the websites that you frequently visit, such as facebook.com google.com or uh, maybe uh, gmail.com or any other website for that matter and try to use this inspect tool and see what their html markup looks like it will expose you to different html tags uh, which will help you to understand them when i introduce when I, when i start introducing those html tags to you from next chapter onwards so this is it for now uh, from next, in the next chapter, we'll be writing a sample HTML code and you will be using this inspect tool to see how it looks like. So see you in next chapter, guys. Hello students, uh, welcome to this new chapter. So this chapter is going to be a little special for you because this is the first chapter we'll be writing some actual code. So this first chapter is going to be about writing a sample HTML code and show you how to execute that and run it on your browser. So to do that, I'll go ahead. I've created a class folder on my desktop. Inside this class folder, I'll be putting up all the course website files that we'll be creating throughout this course. Now I'll open Sublime Text, my code editor, and I'll click on new window over here. Inside this Sublime Text, I'll be opening this folder that I have created for the course website files. Okay, guys, I'll just do it a full screen over here so that you can see it properly. So now I don't have to open that class folder again and again. The class folder is opened inside Sublime Text itself. So when, I, when I'll be saving some files inside it, it will appear below the class folder over here. And if I have to edit it, I'll just right click, double click on it and the file will open inside Sublime Text Editor. So guys, I'll be writing some code and I'll be running it on the browser to show you how it looks like. As we saw in our first chapter in this section, the first tag that comes on the page is doc type and that is HTML. I'll just save this page first. To save a page, I'll save the page inside class folder. You have to add the extension as dot HTML. I'll may name it as first code dot html please note that the extension should be dot html or dot htm and then only the browser will open it as a html file i'll click on save and it's done so inside this doc type html we have told the browser that my document type is html and please treat it as one now we'll create the first html tag we'll open the tag and close it 
uh, guys please notice that over here I am putting proper identification and that is rarely required when you are writing code otherwise if you are not identifying your code properly uh, when you actually revisit your code after a few days or after a few months you won't be able to identify how your code has been written the structure of the code won't be visible. So as a good practice, we'll always identify our code properly. I've opened this HTML tag over here and I'll be closing it right now. Guys, if you don't understand the meaning of it, just hold on for a moment and I'll explain you what it means. All the HTML pages come with two tags, which is very important. One is the head tag. Uh, and as you can see, guys, over here, as soon as I wrote head tag, my code editor has automatically closed that tag for me. So it saves on the effort and that is one of the perks of using a good code editor. I'll open the body tag over here and I'll close it now. So guys, uh, to help you explain HTML tag, I'll give you an example over here, an uh, analogy from real life. Let's say you have an entrepreneurial mindset and you decide to open a printing business. But there are a lot of printing guys in your town. I mean, there are a lot of shops that does printing. So as a differentiator, to make it easy for people to get documents printed, what you have done is, you ask them to send the file, to send the text that they want to get printed directly via WhatsApp to you. You will print it and deliver it to their home. But the problem with WhatsApp is that when they send the text to you, you don't understand that what part of the text is to be underlined, is to be made bold, if people want to do so. So to overcome that, you ask people to put certain text inside angle brackets if they want to get it uh, decorated in a specific way. So let's say if they want to make it underlined, they can put the underlined text inside the tag and write like make it underlined. They can close the angle bracket and write this text has to be underlined. like this and they can uh, close it with make it underline okay so when your guy who sits in your office sees this angle brackets he knows he reads the instruction over here and he makes this text underlined manually okay but now your business grows now your business grows to an extent where you're getting 100 to 200 documents to be printed every day now because there is no standardization in these tags that are instructions for the text inside them, it becomes very difficult for you to scale your business because you have to manually go through the document at all times and then identify what decoration has to be done for a particular text and how it has to be printed. So you create a list of certain tags and you share it or broadcast it via WhatsApp to your clients. Maybe you can name them as underline. So whenever a text has to be underlined, it has to be wrapped up inside that underline tag. When it has to be made bold, it has to be made as bold. When it has to be made as italics, the user, the client has to mention it italics, so on and so forth. I hope you get the idea. Now, there's a certain standard when people are sending you files to be printed via WhatsApp. If any tag has been used apart from these tags, it is ignored and you just print the document as it is. So now what you can do is you can write a program that identifies these tags and automatically applies that design to that particular text which is written inside this tag. So now you can scale your business and you can print unlimited number of documents in a day. Guys, the same thing happens with markup languages. The full form of HTML is hypertext markup language. Hypertext markup language. What it means is it is a standard language for writing code for browsers for web pages. There are certain tags which have a specific role and because there are standard tags, all the browsers know how to handle those tags and build the web page accordingly. I hope you understand the meaning of these HTML tags now. So when you're writing this HTML opening tag and closing tag, basically the browser, when it looks at it, it understands that all the HTML code of this web page is going to be inside this HTML opening tag and HTML closing tag. The purpose of this head tag is to store certain files that describe what this web page is about. As we can see, one of the most important things that we write in the head section is a title tag. So title tag is going to have an open and close tag. 
And as you can see, whenever we write the close tag, there's a forward slash in front of it, which means it is a closing tag. In the opening tag, there is no such slash over here. Inside the title tag, we'll write, uh, let's say this is a test website. Now we'll open this page in the browser. So you can see guys over here, in this section, this is a test website has come. So the title that you see on the web pages is basically what has been written in the title tag of that page. Okay. We'll open the code file again and we'll go ahead. So this head tag is defining or describing what the website is about. When we are going to write CSS, that is also be go be going to be written in this head tag. And you can describe further thing if you want to, like there are some meta characters that are defined, which uh, helps website like Google understand what your website is about. But mostly this head tag is not something that a user sees on the web page itself, but it's mostly a description of what the website is about. What the user sees is generally written inside the body tag. So I'll go ahead and write over here, this is a test website. When I refresh this page over here, you can see this is a test website has been written over here. I hope it's clear to you guys. So, but this is a test website. It still looks very naive. This is because it hasn't been wrapped under any HTML tag right now. To see under what HTML tags these text or these things can be wrapped up, we'll start seeing it from next chapter onwards. So this is sample HTML code. If you want to write some further lines over here, it can be written. Uh, this is a new line. I'll go and refresh the web page over here and this also comes up. So guys, I hope uh, you're quite comfortable with this uh, sample HTML code. Now, if you want to inspect element and see, you can just inspect and it comes up. So this is exactly the code that we have written on our web page and the browser is showing you in the HTML markup when you click on inspect element. So see you in next section guys, where we'll be discussing a few more HTML tags and uh, it's going to be really interesting. Hello guys. In today's class, we'll be covering a few more HTML tags. We already saw how to write a sample HTML code in a previous lecture. So we'll build upon that and uh, learn about a few more HTML tags in this lecture. So over here, I've created a new folder called HTML inside the class folder, which I showed you guys in the last class. Inside the HTML folder, I've created a template.html file. So this piece of code is going to act as a template whenever we write a new HTML code so that we don't have to write it again and again from scratch. I'll create a new file. I'll click on command N. If you're using Windows, then you'll have to click on control N for the new file. So a new file has been created. I'll copy paste the code here. I'll save it using command S. You guys can use control S for you if you're using Windows. So we are good today. We are going to create this entire web page which, uh, which you are viewing right now uh, by writing our own code. So I go back to over here and I write the name of the file as html underscore page dot html and I save it. We go back and edit the title of the page in the code. Uh, we can put the title, I'll zoom in a little bit so that it's more clear to you guys. Yeah, I hope uh, it's pretty clear now. So I'll edit the title of the page and I'll make it web development lessons. I'll save it by pressing command S. Again, it's control S for you guys if you're using Windows. And I'll open this page on Google Chrome. There you go. So we have web development lessons in the title written over here on this web page. Now we'll go ahead and use a new tag, which is called as H1. Okay, guys. So before we start writing the code now, I'll open the HTML tags page and first explain these tags to you. So in the last class, we went through HTML tag, head tag, title tag, and body tag. So head tag, HTML tag, head tag, and body tag is something which is present in all the web pages that you view on the internet. But these are some of the 
optional HTML tags which we use depending upon if we use it, if it's required or not on our web page. Edge tags, as the name mentioned. So guys, all of the HTML tags are actually uh, very easy to understand from their name itself. Edge tags, which we are going to use right now, which is H1, are nothing but heading tags. And these come in six forms, H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6, used for writing headings on page. What this means is that, let's say if you're writing an essay, and the essay is, uh, what do I want to become when I grow old? So the heading of that essay is, what do I want to become when I grow old? And it's the most important heading of your essay. So it is called as H1. Now let's suppose you want to add more subtitles on your essay. So you go ahead and add the first subtitle as what my teachers wanted me to become. That can be the first subtitle. The second subtitle would can be what my parents wanted me to become. And the third subtitle can be what I really wanted to become. So these are not as important as the main heading of the essay, but these are still headings used inside your essay. So these are called as H2. Similarly, if you're using some heading inside your subtitles, that can become H3, H4, H5, H6, so on and so forth. I hope you understand it. Now, because the heading one is the most important heading on the page, it can only be, or it should only be used once on the page. Other heading tags can be used multiple times, depending upon how many times they are required. So we'll go ahead and write H1 as Web Development Lessons because that is the heading of this page. Uh, uh, over here, as you can see, H1 and title is same. So in many cases, it can be same, but can be different as well. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule about it. Depending upon the kind of web page that you're designing, the requirement can differ. So we have added the H1 tag on our page. Now, if we go back, and uh, refresh the page that we created, we can see that web development lessons have come up. Okay, so now we are going to see H2, H2 tags into action. This is the H2 tag, as you can see over here. So we'll go ahead, uh, we'll copy it so that we don't have to type it again. And we'll write a H2 tag. So it's done. Uh, I'll refresh the page and over here. So guys, as you can see, we have two heading tags on the page now. Web Development Lessons is the H1 tag and HTML Topics to Cover is the H2 tag. As you can see, H2 tag is a little bit smaller in size when compared to H1 tag. Uh, why is it happening so can be a valid question. So to find that out, I'll click on Inspect and I'll select this element. Now, when you go ahead and see on the design side, H1 tag has some style associated with it. The font size is 2EM, the display is block, etc., etc., the font weight is bold, so on and so forth. And when I click on H2, its font size is 1.5EM. So that justifies why H2 is looking smaller than H1. When we are working on CSS in the next section, we'll learn to add our own custom style to these elements as we see fit or as we define it to look beautiful. So that will completely be controlled by the CSS that we write for the web page. For now, uh, browser, uh, I'd like to explain you that browser has its own default style for certain HTML tags, and that is what is being applied to these HTML elements if we are not defining CSS from our site. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and see what are the tags we have to cover today. So there is one tag called as div tag. Div tag are used to create containers which separates content on your page. What does that mean? So div tag is actually a very important tag and you'll be often be using on your pages a lot if you're creating complex long web pages. Uh, to give you an example what it is actually about, I'll just search something on Google. I'll search HTML itself. And as you can see, Different HTML, div is basically used to group elements on a web page. So as you can see, different search results over here can be a div tag. See, this is a group of one search result, group of one search result, so on, so forth. So all of this can be a div tag inside. 
Inside div tag, you can add multiple elements which will together form that particular group. I hope you get an idea of it. Even if you do not, then uh, as uh, we are going to use div tags a lot, especially when we are going to write CSS designs, you will get the hang of it. So for now, uh, we'll assume that this section of our website is going to be a particular group because it contains one list. So we'll add it in a div element. Okay. So we have uh, entered a div tag. I'll save it. Uh, nothing will change on the on our web page because still we haven't entered any content inside the div tag. Okay, so now we have para tags. Para tags are basically used to write text or paragraphs. So I'll go ahead and write a p tag over here. Here is the list of HTML topics that we are going to cover, and I'll close the p tag. When I go and refresh it, you can see that this particular sentence has come over here. Okay, I'll add a colon as well. Yeah. I'll refresh it and the colon has appeared. So guys, this is how we use p tag on a page. p tag is only used for writing some text or paragraphs. Uh, as the p tag, as I told you earlier, all the HTML tags are quite literal in their meanings. P stands for paragraphs and paragraphs, as we write in essays and letters as well, paragraphs is basically used to write a chunk of text. A tag is a very important tag, which is used for creating links. Now, as you can see, when I click on this particular link, this new page is opening up. This is what an A tag does. So I'll go ahead and create a A tag also, I'll go on the bottom, I'll exit the div tag, I'll add a p tag over here, and I'll write to open a new page, please click here. So, and to do that, I'll have to mention a a tag. This is how a tag is opened, and then a tag is closed. But to define what will happen on clicking a a tag, we need to add an attribute. That attribute is called as href. So for a few HTML tags, you can mention the attribute as well. Attribute is basically extra information about that particular HTML tag that defines what should happen when a user takes some action on that HTML tag or when that HTML tag is loaded onto the web page. In case of a tag, href defines what link should open if the user is going to click on this text over here, which is wrapped inside the a tag. So I'll take the path of any file. Uh, for explanation purposes, I'll take the path of this file itself and I'll enter it over here. So as you can see, uh, the entire path of that file has come over here. I'll go back. I'll click on refresh and as you can see to open a new page please click here text has come i'll click on please click here and this file has opened over here i'll click on back button and i'll come back here now guys there's one more attribute which is quite popularly used for a, a tag which is target if you don't mention a target attribute by default the page opens on the same tab same Google Chrome tab, the page is opening. But if I want to open the page on a new tab, then I will mention the target as underscore blank. I'll save it and then I'll open the page again. Now if I click on click here, a new tab is going to open. As you can see, a new tab with tags and table has opened over here. I hope this is clear to you now. So I'll go ahead and I'll see another tag which we have. BR. BR is used for adding a line break. So let's say if we refresh this page right now, there is certain space between both the P tags over here. But what if we want more space between them? Then we'll go there and write the BR tag after this P tag. Now guys, there's no content that is written in the BR tag. So we don't have to write open and close twice. 
we can just open the tag here and close in the same tag by giving a space and then writing forward slash and closing the angle bracket. This is because no particular content has to be wrapped inside this HTML tag. So I'll click on refresh and as you can see the space has increased. If I and guys, uh, one thing to note over here is that if you add blank spaces, blank enters in your code and you save it, then nothing is going to happen on your web page. The browser, when it is actually building a web page using the HTML code, it completely ignores the empty sentences. The user does not see that. So if you want to add blank spaces, you will have to use the BR tag. Okay, so moving on to the next tag, I'll use HR. HR is a line separator. It is used to add a line between elements. What if we want to have a line separator after our H2 tag? Maybe we want a line over here and then we start our paragraph elements. So we'll go to H2 after this. We'll add a HR tag and we'll close it here itself. Again, HR tag doesn't wrap any content inside it. So you can open and close in single tag over there itself. I'll refresh it. And as you can see, a line has come up. I'll zoom in a bit if you're unable to view it. So a line has come. Now going ahead. So we'll be using a span tag quite often, especially when we are designing it. Span is used to group a certain group of words. Now let's suppose we wanted to group HTML topics together, then we could wrap it inside a span tag and HTML topics can be grouped inside a separate HTML tag. So they are both inside the P tag, but HTML topics have a separate span tag as well. Now what is span tag is used for uh, will become quite more clear when we are covering the CSS section. So for now you can just assume that it is used to group a part of text as I showed already. So guys, this is the example of using a few HTML tags on this page as we have done over here. In the next lecture, uh, we are going to cover about how to write comments and then we'll deal with images and then we'll create lists. When we are going to create lists, we are going to complete this web page and we are going to move forward. So see you in next lecture where I'm going to tell you about how to write comments. Hello guys, uh, today's lecture is going to be very simple. As I told you guys in the uh, last class, this time we are going to learn how to write comments and we are going to understand what a comments used for. So, coming back to the code, let's say if you're going to revisit this code after a few months and you want to understand why did you write this div tag over here, how are you going to understand that? You're not going to remember, you ju you'll just have to guess why you used it. For instances like these, and because when your web page code is going to become very complex with a thousand lines of code and different hundreds of files, it will become very difficult for you to track why you did a particular thing and what a particular, uh, let's say a piece of code means. Or especially when a third person is going to revisit your code and understand when you hire a new developer or when your friend is going through your code or if you open source it and other people are going through your code, they will have a very hard time understanding what you tried to do there. So to solve these, this problem, we use comments in our code. This is how we write a comment. We start with the open angle bracket, we give an exclamation mark and then we give double dash and then the comment has started. So I'll mention why we have written this div over here. We have written this div to create a group of element and then we'll create double dash and close angle bracket. So guys, this is just an example of comment that we can write. And if you're going to revisit this code after, let's say, even a month, you'll understand that this div has just been written to demonstrate how to create a group of elements. But this comment is not going to be visible on the web page. So when I refresh it, it's not going to be visible. It's just meant to be a part of the code for you to read when you come back and edit your code or for other people when they're editing your code. I hope you understand that. Hello, students. So today we are going to cover creating lists. 
Before I'm going to cover the section dealing with images, I'd like to cover this list creation because then we'll be able to complete this web page that we are viewing right now. So coming back to the code, which we wrote in the last class. So guys, uh, overhead, if you remember, in the A tag, we use two attributes, href and target. Sometimes multiple attributes can be used in an HTML tag and they can have their own values. Like target has a value of blank, which is written in inverted commas, and href had a value of this path, which is written in inverted commas again. So the value is always written in inverted commas. There has to be a space between the value of the previous attribute and the next attribute by which the browser un understands that this is a different attribute. So guys, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start creating a list now. So to create a list, we need to begin with the ul tag. I'll do it after the br tag. So ul tag marks the start of a list and I'll close this ul tag over here. Under the ul tag, so basically this just tells the browser that the list is about to begin. As you can see, this entire list is under a ul tag. To write different elements of the ul tag, such as over here an element or a bullet point, is using tools in Chrome. This has to be written in a li tag. So we'll write over here using tools in Chrome. And I'll close the li tag. So as you can see over here, guys, uh, what we have done is we started a list with a ul tag. And then we wrote the first point or the first list element using the li tag. Now going ahead, we'll complete the list. I'll just copy paste some li tags over here as a placeholder for entering the content for them. Okay. And now I'll just copy paste them from here. short of going like that and I copy pasted the same thing there so I'll remove it I'm replacing the dealing with images which has been written twice with creating lists and the last element is making table okay guys so I've saved the file I'll go and refresh it now and as you can see the entire list of the uh, of this page which was mentioned over here has appeared on the page that we have created right now as well. So I hope you understand how to write the list now. Uh, for our purpose I'll just complete this page now. I'll remove the BR tag because that is quite not required. It was just mentioned for demonstration purposes in the last lecture. So I'll refresh it again and we have a complete working list with us now. Guys the files that we are creating in each lecture I'll, I'm adding those in the resources section or I'm providing the links to these files so you can refer them by downloading them on your own laptop as well. So I'll end this lecture over here. In the next lecture, we'll understand how to deal with images. See you soon. Hello guys, welcome to this class where we'll learn how to deal with images. So I'll go ahead and create a new file for dealing with images. And as you can see in my folder structure, I've created a new folder called page pages inside the HTML folder. We'll be storing the pages that we have created for the HTML homepage. So basically when you click on this some HTML tags or with dealing with images, a new HTML page is opened. So we'll save those files inside this pages folder. And inside the pages folder, I've created the image folder where we'll store images which are going to be used in the, inside this HTML project. So I'll go ahead and copy the template which we created earlier and paste it in this new file. Then I'm going to save this inside the pages folder with the name, let's say, image.html. Okay, guys. Now I'll go ahead and inside the body section, I'm going to write uh, first, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and link this with the file that I created just right now. 
href and closing this tag over here. I'll add the target equal to blank so that it's opened in a new tab. Okay. And in the href, currently I've mentioned it blank. So for writing the path, right now this file is inside the HTML folder, which is HTML page dot HTML. Now it is referencing to a file which is inside the pages folder. So just a minute guys, I think I have mentioned the path of this file wrong. So I'm going to save it again using the save as option inside the picture. Oh no, it's right. Uh, my bad. So it's stored correctly. So it's inside this image.html is inside the pages folder. Now we have to reference it. So, and this uh, HTML page.html is inside the HTML folder. So to reference a file inside the folder, we'll first write the name of that folder, which is pages, and then slash the name of that HTML page, which is h.html. So as you can see, this pages folder is in the same folder as this HTML page.html. So we directly write the name of that folder. Then we give a slash. And then inside that folder is the image.html file. So we reference it over there. Okay. Uh, going ahead. So just to test if it's working, I'll write uh, sample text over there. This is image file. And I save it. I go back to the page. I refresh it. And as you can see, it has been hyperlinked because the A tag has been applied to this list element. I click on it. And you can see this is image file. That sample text which we wrote in this file has appeared on this web page. So we'll go ahead and add an image tag to this now. Image tag is written as IMG. And it has some attributes such as SRC. I'm keeping the attributes empty right now. I'll explain them one by one. Alt. And let's say we'll be using a width attribute as well. And then there's no content inside the image tag. Everything is mentioned in the attribute. So we are going to close it directly. I'm going to save this page. So first, SRC is the source where we mention the path of the image. Like in the href, ta href attribute of the A tag, we mention the path of the file or path or the URL. In the image SRC tag, we mention the URL or the path of the image. SRC stands for source. All tag is a text. So let's say uh, first we'll get the SRC. So for that, I have an image over here in my class folder. I'll copy it. I'll go in the HTML folder, then pages, then image, and I'll paste this image over here. The name of this image is thumb.jpg, and it's stored inside pages, then image. Okay. So right now we are inside the pages folder. Image.html is stored inside the pages. Inside the pages is the image folder and then inside image is thumb.jpg. So as we wrote previously, we'll write image, the name of the folder, and then thumb.jpg, the name of the file. Okay. And now when we go and refresh this page, the image is appearing over here. So what we'll do is, now in the alt text, which is the second attribute, uh, this is basically something that won't be visible right away. But let's say if the internet connection of a user is weak, then you write a text in the alt attribute like this. Uh, the description of this image would be a HTML CSS image. And if that image is unable to load, this text will be loaded, which will help the user know that this image was regarding something called HTML and CSS. This is especially use, useful for blind people. Blind people have special devices for visiting websites where they can visit the web page using Braille or those kind of languages. And because they're unable to view the image itself, they can read the description of the image, which is mentioned in the alt attribute. So this is quite useful for them. And that's why we should always mention it when we are creating an image tag. Now this image is completely coming in its full size right now. And it kind of looks awkward. So we'll control the width of this image. We'll mention 600 over here. And let's see what happens. So as you can see, the width of the image has reduced. What I've done right now is, by specifying the width equal to 600, the browser has shrinked this image to 600 pixel width. 
Now the height of the image is also adjusted automatically. So if you don't define height on your own, the browser actually changes the height in the aspect ratio of the image according to the width. So if the image was into a 2 is to 1 ratio, that was let's say it was a 3600 into 1800 image. If I change it into 600, which is 3600 divided by 6, then the height is also divided by 6 in that ratio itself. But if you want to hard code the height and make the browser open it in that specific height, let's say I mention it 100 over here and then I refresh it. So the image will start looking like this. I hope you understand how to use the image tag now. In the next section, we are going to cover how to use tables in HTML. Hello students. So we are down to our last chapter in the HTML section now, which is making tables. So we'll proceed and see how we can make tables in HTML. In the previous reference web page that I was showing you, there was a table with all the HTML tags present. So today in our lecture, we are going to make this page with the table that contains all these HTML tags and their description. It will also act as a good point for us to revise all these HTML tags. So I'll go ahead to the code page. I'll create a new file in my editor and I'll copy the template HTML from here. I'll mention the title as uh, HTML tags table and I'll save it inside the pages folder. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and create this HTML table. But before that, I'll create the link to this HTML tags from our home page of HTML section so that we are able to visit this page. Okay, and I'll keep the target as equal to blank because I want to open it in a new tab. If you don't want to open it in a new tab, then just uh, ignore the target attribute. Okay, so we have wrapped this text inside the A tag now. I'll mention the path over here. The path is pages slash HTML tags underscore table dot html which is the name of the file as we have saved it i'll do control s and this has been saved i'll also hyperlink this making table with the same page because in fact that is going to be a table now we'll go back to our page and refresh it and as you can see both these links have been hyperlinked now so right now we don't have anything on this page so it's open uh, so it's opening up empty now we are going to create a table inside that file so to create a table, uh, first I'll add a heading uh, of this page, which is going to be HTML tags table. Now I'll go ahead and create a table. So create a table. The first tag that you need to mention is going to be a table tag. And I'll close this table tag over here. Okay. So inside the table, as if you, if you would have used Microsoft Excel, there are certain rows and columns. The HTML table also works in the same way. If you look at this table, this is one column and this is the other column. This is a row and the other rows are also subsequently called rows. The first row is quite special because it contains the details of what the columns are about. So now going ahead to create a row in a table, we write TR. Okay. And for the first row, if we have to mention the title of the columns, we are going to use th. And inside this th element, uh, because we are going to have two columns, I'm going to mention two th over here. Please note that I'm identifying my code always properly and you should also do the same. Otherwise, you're going to face problems in the future. The name of the first column is HTML tag. So I'm copying pasting it over there. And then what they do again over here. Now we'll go and open this page that we have we are creating right now and see how it looks. So as you can see, HTML tag and what they do has come. 
Now, right now, this table might not look as a table to you because it hasn't been designed. In the CSS section, we are going to design this table and uh, will evidently make it look more like a table as we are used to seeing it. So I'll go ahead and add more rows to this table. I'll create some TR elements. Uh, first, I'll create one. And then from the second row onwards, which is not the title of the columns, we are going to use TD element. So there are going to be two TD element because our table contains two columns. Okay. Inside the TD element, uh, firstly we are going to write the first row is about H tags. H tags was heading tags, which could be H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6, depending upon the type of heading that you are writing. So I'll paste this value over here and the second value over here. So we'll go back, refresh our page and see how it looks. As you can see, uh, this has come on the page directly. Now I'll go a little fast and I'll copy paste some columns as placeholder values. Okay. Now I'll start copying the values from here. I'll first copy the name of the first column and then I'll start copying the second column. Okay, now I'll start copying pasting the second column. Okay, so we are done now. We'll go and refresh this page and have a look at what the table looks like now. So, okay, it's done. Our table has been created. And just to revise it, so I'll go through all the HTML tags once again. H tag is heading tag. Div is used to create containers. P is used for writing text or paragraphs. A is used for creating links. BR tag is used for adding a line break. HR tag is used for adding line separators. And span tag is used for grouping a part of text. Apart from this, right now we have learned about table tag. Uh, in the previous classes, we have also learned about li tag and image tag. So these are some other tags that we have covered in our HTML section. So basically, students, now if you actually just remember these HTML tags that we have discussed in this section, you'll be able to create a number of web pages without even referencing other HTML tags. In fact, 95% of the times, even if you're creating complex web pages, these are the HTML tags that you're going to use. I hope you now understand how we create HTML pages. Over the course of this uh, lecture in this section, we have created two pages. This home page of HTML topics, where we have hyperlinked it with the HTML tag page, which is the same hyperlinked with the making table page. And we have created a page where we have learned how to deal with images. I'll be adding these files in the reference of this lecture so that you can download it and have a look at it again, so that you can refresh what the code looks like. Hello students, hope you all are having a good day. So we have completed the HTML section now and we are going to proceed to the CSS section. So we learned in the HTML section how to create HTML web pages. Now going forward, we are going to learn how can we design the pages that we created in the HTML section? So students, I have created more, uh, I have added more folders inside the class folder uh, with files for CSS, intro and JavaScript as well. I'll add this entire folder as a zip file in the resource section of this lecture so you can download them and refer on your laptop as well. So no other HTML tags have been used to create these web pages other than what we learned in the HTML section. So the fundamentals remain the same and you can try to create these web pages on your own 
and if you find any difficulties, you can refer to the files that have been attached in the resource section. Moving ahead to the CSS section. So today, we'll be covering default styling, which is also called as user agent style sheet. If you remember students, we covered this topic briefly in the HTML section as well. But just to re-emphasize it, and because it's the foundation of what we'll be learning in the CSS section, I'll cover this topic once again. So I'll just go ahead and do an inspect element on this page. I'll click the cursor icon and I'll go and select any element on the page. I've selected the H2 element, which is CSS topics to cover. If you can see on the right side students, um, there is some style properties mentioned for this element. So whenever we create HTML elements, they automatically, as you can see, H2 is smaller than H1 and the other list elements are smaller than H2 and the A tag is blue in color and underlined on its own. And when I'm taking my cursor on the A tag, it changes to a pointer. So students, how is it happening without us defining what the characteristic of these elements should be? So every browser comes with some preset styles, which is known as user agent style sheet. And if you haven't defined any CSS on your own, so students, this is what the CSS code will look like, as you can see here, when we are going to write it from next chapter onwards. But for now, what you need to understand is that even if you're not mentioning any style properties for a HTML element, there are some default properties that come into action. In the next chapters, we'll understand how we can change these default properties and overwrite them with the properties that we define. So I hope you understand this. We'll cover inline styling. We'll learn to add some CSS properties to the HTML elements that we have on our web page in the next chapter. See you soon. Hello students. I hope you're all ready to do CSS styling now. We have created multiple HTML web pages over the course of past few chapters. And now in the next few chapters, we are going to learn how to design the web pages that we created earlier. Today, we are going to cover a topic called inline styling. So students, inline as you can make out from the word, inline means on the same line. So coming back to the code file, if we define the style of this element, this uh, h2 tag in the same line in which it has been written, it will be called as inline styling. I hope you get that. So inline styling is styling when we write it in the same line as the element. Quite literal meaning and very easy to understand. So students, every HTML element or tag comes with an attribute called as style. We covered attributes in the HTML section. Attributes are nothing, but they actually define some characteristic or properties of the element for which they are being written. And style is an attribute which is present for all the HTML tags. Inside this style, we'll add some styling property. Let's say there's a styling property called color. So I'll write color, I'll give colon, and I'll, re I, uh, I'll write red. Okay. I'll save the file. I'll go and refresh it. And as you can see, H2 is now red in color. So students, there are a lot of CSS properties and you need not remember all of them. As you practice and move forward, you will start remembering the names of the most common CSS properties that you will be using. But really, there's no need to, for you to memorize all of them. Uh, it will just come to you with practice. Now students, right now we have defined the color red for this H2 element. But often, we'll have to define multiple CSS properties for the same element. Let's say we also want to change the font size of this. Or we want to make it underlined. Or we want to make it center aligned. So how do we write multiple CSS properties on the same line? So students, if you have to write multiple CSS properties inside the style attribute, after writing color red, I'll give a semicolon. And I'll write, I'll write the next CSS property. Let's say it is font size. And students, as you can see, as I, write uh, as I write the name of the CSS property, I start getting multiple suggestions. And if I just click enter, that suggestion is selected. So that will happen on your code editor also when you're using it. So it will make uh, writing code very easy for you. Writing CSS property is very easy, even though if you don't remember all of them. Now, let's say I write font size as 72 px. I write semicolon again. I save the file. I come back and refresh it. And as you can see, the font of this element has increased. 
let's say I want to add one more CSS properties over here, which is text align, which is used for aligning a text on the screen, and I make it center. So student, as you can see, it has come on the center now. Now student will use the inspect element to see how the browser shows the CSS property of this particular element. I'll click on the cursor. I'll go on this element. And as you can see, inside the element.style section, all the properties that we defined in the file is being shown over here. Now students, uh, color is written as red over here. But we remember the names of very few colors. And there are unlimited colors out there. For, to solve this problem, we use hex codes often. Hex codes are basically a numeric representation of the colors uh, followed by a hashtag. So as you can see, as I actually draw my cursor over these colors, the hex code at the bottom is changing depending upon the color that I'm selecting. Let's say I like this color, 7B0A0A. So I want this color to be the color of CSS topics to cover on this particular web page. But student changing the color over here doesn't do much. It's just a visual representation on this instance of the web page. Because, let me first copy this color. Because when I refresh this web page, that color is going to get lost. Because that instance of the web page, which was loaded earlier, now is overwritten by the new web page, which is loaded. When the new web page is loaded, it takes the CSS property from the code file itself. So if you want this to be a permanent color, you need to go and add this in the code file. Yeah, so this was the color that we used earlier. Now, if we want to be per it to be permanent, we'll go back to the code file. And instead of red, we'll write this over there, save it, come back, and now refresh this page, and that will still be the color of that particular element. So students, we have covered two topics in this section. One is inline styling and the other is how to use Chrome tool to edit CSS on a page. In the Chrome tool, if you want to add new CSS properties to see how it looks, you can just click the cursor over here and a new property, a uh, placeholder for new property will come on the bottom. Let's say I want to add some kind of text decoration. I want to make it underline. So I'll write text decoration property and I'll make it underline. Now, as you can see, it is underlined. Again, for it to take effect, I'll have to copy this CSS property, go back to the web page, and paste it here, and then save it, so that now when I refresh the web page, that property will still be there. So student, um, before we end this chapter, we'll apply style property, style attribute, to one more element. Let's say we apply it to the inline styling list element. I'll write style over here. And let us make the color of this element as uh, yellow. Again, I'm writing the uh, literal name of the color, but there are unlimited colors out there. If you want to use a hex code of a particular shade of yellow, you can find it from Chrome or you can use other tools to find the hex code of colors as well. I'll go back, I'll refresh the page, and as you can see, this element is now yellow in color. So students, I hope you understand how to write inline styling now. And if you want to refer different CSS properties, you can just go on Google and search list of CSS properties. And a number of CSS properties are going to come onto your web page. You can go through them if you want to. It's a quite extensive list. Uh, but the very common CSS properties that you'll generally need will be covering in this section. So that should suffice. But this is just to show you that there are actually hundreds of CSS properties out there for you to help you design the website. In this lecture, today we used four CSS properties. One is color, which defines the font color. Font size, which defines the size of the font. We are writing this font size in pixels. Text align, which defines the alignment of the text. And text decoration, which defines how the text will look like. Will it be underlined? Will it be italics? Or will there be no text decoration at all? Okay, students, see you in next class when we'll be discussing a very interesting topic called IDs and classes. Hello, students. Today we are just going to discuss a very important topic called as IDs and classes. 
So students, you're going to use this a lot when you're writing HTML and CSS code because they make the process of writing CSS very easy. But before we get into that, how to use them for writing CSS, uh, we'll first understand what are IDs. So students, ID property of the element interface represents the element's identifier. If the ID value is not an empty string, it must be unique in a document. And what are classes? The class attribute is a space separated list of the classes of the element. It is typically used to group a set of elements and provide them common design using CSS or manipulate them using JavaScript. Now student, before I get into uh, the real explanation of both these topics, let me first give you an example. I hope you remember your college days if you have passed out of college and I'm sure you remember them if you are still in college. So in college, every student generally has a unique ID which is known as the registration number or any other name that you might have in your college. That number is unique for every student. So basically that acts as a unique identifier for that student in the college. Now in your college, you can have different sections and in a section you can have 40 or 50 students. Apart from sections, you can also have different club, uh, clubs in your college. Let's say a guitar club, a entrepreneurship club, and so on and so forth. Now being a student, the unique identifier, the registration number that you have, that becomes the ID in case of an HTML element. So imagine HTML elements to be students in a college and every HTML element has a unique ID as every student has a unique identifier, which is their registration number in the college. But every HTML element can also be a part of certain classes and multiple HTML element can be a part of the same class and a same element can have multiple classes. Like let's say you as a student can be a part of both guitar club, entrepreneurship club, and at the same time, you will also be there in one of the sections in the class. Similarly, your friend can also be together with you in section A, but not with you in guitar club, so on and so forth. I hope you get the example. So if you want, you can just play back this example in your mind and Actually, IDs are very similar to that unique registration number of the student in the college and classes are just like those clubs or sections. So how do we write them in a HTML document? To write the ID and uh, students, these attributes are not mandatory. So basically they are also going to be attribute of an element and it's not mandatory. You define them only if you want to. But if you define an ID in a HTML web page, a ID should be completely unique. They cannot be repeated. So let's say I give the ID of this heading web dev. So this becomes the ID of this page. And if I want to define the, let's say class also of this. So class can be heading and you can write multiple classes for the same element. Like if you remember from my example, you can be a part of different clubs. You can be a part of guitar club and it can be a part of entrepreneurship club at the same time. So similarly, an element can be a part of multiple classes heading. And let's say I have one more class, which is called bold item. So I'll add one more class to it. So when you add multiple classes, they should have at least a single space between them. Okay. Now I'll go ahead and add one more class to this list element. I'll add it to this IDs and classes class equal to ID classes. Okay. So you can use uh, basically the classes shouldn't have any space in between them. If you want to have any kind of separator, you can use underscore or dash. So students, I hope you understand how to write ID and class attribute of an element and what they basically mean. We'll use them in the further sections to understand how they can be used to write CSS properties of an element more effectively. See you in next class. Hello student, in today's class, we are going to discuss this topic, internal and external styling. So I hope you remember in the previous classes, uh, we have done inline styling and we discussed what are IDs and what are classes. So students, I'll just go ahead and write a style attribute for this element. I hope you remember how to write the style attribute. I'll just write color red and I'll refresh the page. And as you can see, color red has been applied to the H2 element over here. So student, uh, 
Inline styling meant writing style on the same line as the HTML element. Today we are first going to discuss internal styling. As inline styling means writing CSS on the same line as the HTML, internal styling means writing CSS on the same page as the HTML element. But to discuss uh, how to write internal styling, first we'll need to discuss why do we need internal styling. This is because writing inline styling comes with certain disadvantages. First of all, let's say if you write 10 different CSS properties of this H2 element on the same line, the code will start looking clumsy. And now imagine you have hundreds of lines of HTML code on this page with hundreds of CSS properties for each element. So the CSS code and the HTML code is going to be completely intermingled and it's not going to look good at all. So this is the first disadvantage of using the inline styling. The second disadvantage is, let's say I want to make two of my li elements as color red. One is default styling and the other is internal and external styling. I did it and when I refresh the page, it has been done. But to do so, I had to write the style element twice for the same element. This can be easily accomplished by using a common class and writing the CSS property of that class in the internal styling sheet. We'll see how to do that uh, further along in this chapter. So how do we write internal styling? Once we have understood the disadvantage of uh, using in inline styling, it uh, actually builds a case for us to start writing internal styling now. To write internal styling, we'll go inside the head tag of the HTML document We'll write a HTML tag called style. We'll close this tag. And inside this style tag, now you can write C CSS properties for all the elements that you want. So this is how we write the CSS property inside this style tag. Let's suppose I again want to make my H2 as color red. I'll write the H2 tag name, give a space, give an open parenthesis and a closing parenthesis, press enter, and I'll write the CSS property, which is color red. Let's suppose I also want to write the font size. I'll mention font size and I'll make it 72 px. Now when I go on the page and refresh it, you can see that H2 is color red and font size is 72 px. Okay students, I hope you understand up till now. Uh, now what we are going to do is, we are going to quickly design this page with some CSS properties. First of all, I think uh, this page is because there's too much text and all of that is on the left side of the page. We can add some padding between the left and right side so that the text comes onto the center. Uh, just talking from a design perspective. So how can we do that? So students, there's a property called padding. What padding does is it adds a superfluous or empty space around the element. So we will go ahead and add a padding to the entire body. We'll add it to the body HTML tag itself, so it will be applied to the entire web page. We'll write the body element, and we'll write padding as padding, uh, 10 px, 350px, 10px, 350px. So the syntax goes like this, students. In fact, you can refer it just by easily googling it, as I showed you in one of the classes before. This padding comes in the form of top, right, bottom, left. So it's going to give a 10px padding on the top, 350 on the right side, 10px on the left side, and 350px, oh sorry, 10px on the bottom side, and 350px on the left side. We'll refresh it, save it and refresh it over here. And as you can see, the text has now come on the center with a padding on both left and right side. Uh, easy enough. Now we'll use Chrome to edit the CSS of this page. As I told you, Chrome is quite useful because you can directly see how the page is looking on the tool itself. So we'll design here and we'll copy paste it in the web page file for it to take a permanent effect. Okay, students. So I'll just uh, go ahead, I'll select a font size, I'll make it 48px. I'll make it text align center. So student, I'm going to go a little fast now because I hope you understand how everything is working. In any case, if you don't understand, I'll be attaching the code files in the resource section, which you can download and refer on your own. Uh, what we are going to do in this section is we'll go fast and design the entire web pages that we have created right now and make it look beautiful. Font family. So font family is a CSS property students that is used to describe 
the how the font uh, will look like okay so as you select times new roman arial comic sans in microsoft word we'll select what the font will look like over here in html as you actually take your cursor over different fonts that is available in chrome you can see what they look like i'm going to go with monospace over here in fact i'm going to use monospace for all the fonts so i'll use it in body directly if you use it in body it will be applied to the entire web page okay so it is done student and this is for h1 i'll take the color as red again i'll just make it a little darker we can just take the hex code directly okay i think this is good i'll copy all the properties and we'll go and create a h1 over here and paste it inside it so do pay attention that i'm always indenting my code properly students it's very re required as i'm mentioning again and again so that when you revisit your code it's easy for you to understand what you have done okay we'll refresh it now we'll check the h2 section so font size i'll make it a little smaller than h1 36 px uh, it's still large 32 px i think will look good okay color i think we can go with something green a little darker though Okay, students, so H2 has been done. We have copied the property and saved it. I'll refresh the page and the changes are still there. Now, student, uh, for the list element, I'll make the font size a little larger. I think this looks good. 16px or I'll just make it 18px so that it's more visible. Okay, and I'll let it be of black color itself. Okay, so as you can see, the entire list element has changed because we have applied it to all the allied tags. Instead, what we could have done is we could have changed it for UL tag also, and it would be applied for all the elements inside the UL tag still the same effect now students will change something for ids and classes i really don't want any underlining i don't like that so we can override the default property by writing text decoration none and i'll let the color be blue so that at least we get to know that it is a link for a tag we are making text decoration none now students uh, you can also define what will happen when you hover over an element so right now we'll change the property of a tag when it is hovered over to change the hover property we write the name of the tag and write is to hover okay colon and then hover over here we'll change the background color when we are hovering over an element we'll make the background color as yellow So now when we are hovering over the element students, you can see that the background color is changing to yellow. I hope you understand over here till now. Now students, let's say for some reason, we want to change the uh, color of an ally element that is inline styling to red. Okay, so we can do it two ways. One is using style color red. As you can see, it has been changed to red color. And but we also want to change the color of internal and external styling as well. So we'll have to copy it there and then write. I covered this previously as well in this chapter, but I'm covering it again so that it's clearer to you guys. So we have to do it twice. Instead, students, there's a way in which we can just make the color red of both these elements at once. To do that, we'll create a class called as, uh, we can give any name to this class, we'll make it list red which means list element is red in color. It can be any name, obviously, I mean, whatever you like. We'll add this class to both the elements and then we'll go in the style tag, we'll write dot and the name of the class list red and then open parenthesis, close parenthesis and color red. 
Okay. Now we'll uh, delete this style attribute from both these elements. We'll go to this page. We'll refresh it, and the color is still red. So, student, when you are writing the CSS properties of the HTML tag itself, you just have to write the name of the tag, which is H1 or H2, ULA, or anything that the name of the tag is. But if you're writing the CSS property of the class, you have to use a dot in front of the class name. Okay, I hope you get it. Now I'll show you how to write CSS with ID. Uh, let's say it's uh, heading 2 is the ID of this element. So to write the CSS of ID, you have to use hash in front of the ID name, which is heading 2 in our case. We'll make it just to show it different. Uh, so we have already defined h2, so I'll copy it, we'll delete it for now, oh, sorry, I forgot to copy it, I'll copy it and delete this and I'll mention this property in the heading 2. So now if you refresh it, that property is still there because we have added in the id. So if you're writing CSS for id, use hashtag in front of the id name. And if you're writing CSS property for a class, use dot in front of the class name. So I'll remove this ID. Uh, obviously, I mean IDs are not generally used much for writing CSS because uh, uh, IDs are unique in nature. But although you can use it at times when required, depending upon the requirement, IDs are actually beneficial when we are writing JavaScript code, as we'll see in the JavaScript chapter. Right now, students, I'll make it H2 again. Uh, not because it's not required for us to use the ID overhead as to very easily suffices our need. Okay, so it's done students. Now overhead, I'd like to explain one more thing. As you can see that we describe the characteristic of UL as font size 18 px. Now for this list red, if we go ahead and write font size as 28 px and then go and refresh it, these two becomes larger. So, still, why is it happening? Why is this font size 28px overwriting this font size 18px? This is because, and the same reason actually lies why our style is overwriting the browser's default styling sheet. So, whenever you define CSS is taken in precedence, it is called cascading style sheet. So, whenever you write CSS for an element over here, li is the child element for ul because it comes inside ul. ul is inside div. So ul is a child element of div. Div is inside body. So div is a child element of body. Whenever you define a separate CSS for a child element, it takes precedence over the CSS defined for the parent element. As easy as that. Okay. And it is called cascading style sheet because it comes falling in nature. If a style has been defined after a certain style, that style takes precedence over the style that had been written before. Now, default styling sheet is loaded the first in the browser, but after that, our style is being loaded, so our style takes precedence over browser's default style sheet. You will understand these concepts more when you keep writing CSS codes on your own. But it's actually not a very difficult concept to grasp, and I hope you understand that now. Now, student, we have actually designed a page quite beautifully over here. Uh, we'll remove this font size and list red class. In fact, it's not required as of now. Yeah, so our page looks quite decent now. Now, student, there's a problem with this. We want the style to be reflected across all the web pages that we have in IDs and classes, in CSS frameworks, so on and so forth. So what we'll do is we'll have to copy this and let's say we'll first change it for IDs and classes. I'll open the IDs and classes. I'll add it in the head section. Now when you open the IDs and classes sheet, it has been applied automatically. Uh, let's change the CSS of P element as well. The para tag we haven't covered because there was no para tag in that web page, CSS home page. Uh, we'll make the font size as 18px. Uh, it looks quite decent. Uh, we'll try to make text align as justify. We'll copy it. Uh, we'll create a p tag at the bottom on this page. Yes. 
So now students, the thing is that you will have to copy this style tag on all the pages for it to take effect. That means an additional 40 to 50 lines of code on all the HTML pages. I really don't want to do that. It's quite clumsy and it increases the size of all the HTML files inside my project. So this is what makes a case for using external styling. External styling means a separate external CSS file, as the name says. Internal styling meant writing CSS on the same page. External styling means writing CSS on a separate page. So how is it done? We'll copy this HTML file. We'll create a new file. We'll paste it over there. Uh, so indentation has gone a little wrong. First we'll save this and then we'll fix the indentation. I'll save it in the home page of our pro, uh, folder called class because it'll be used across all the HTML files that we have created till now. I'll name it style and the extension of this file will be .css. Okay, we'll save it. Use .css. Okay, fine. Uh, we're done here. I'll just quickly change the indentation of all these elements. Okay, students, we are done here. So we have a properly indented CSS file now. So I'll go back to the CSS page.html file. I'll delete this CSS. I'll uncomment this over here. So as you can see, this is a link tag, which is used to include an external file in this HTML page. And as you can see, the, with the rel attribute and the type attribute, we are telling the browser that this is going to be a style sheet CSS file. So what we have to do is, in the href attribute of this link tag, we have to define the path of the style.css. Now because we are inside the CSS folder right now, and our style.css file is inside the class folder, we have to go a folder out, that is done by using double dot and slash. Now we are inside the CSS folder and then we'll write the name of the file, which is style.css. Now student, I'll save this page. We'll go back to web development lesson. We'll refresh it and the design has still been applied. So an external style sheet called style.css is now being loaded in this HTML file. So instead of writing those 40 lines of code in every HTML file, we can just go ahead and include this link in every HTML file and the link will automatically be applied. I hope you're following along student. So I'll fast forward and copy paste this in all the web pages that we have in a project. Okay, students. So as you can see, now the CSS property has been applied to all the pages in our project. You can see. The CSS property are reflecting everywhere on each and all of the pages. So this image has been a little off. Uh, no worries, we'll fix it later. Now, if we want to change the HTML or uh, the CSS properties on all these HTML pages, what we have to do is just make the changes on this style.css and it will be applied to all the pages because we are including the same style sheet in every HTML page inside a project. That's where I think we can lessen this, uh, we can increase the padding a little more so that all of this text is in the center. I'll go ahead and make it 400 px. We'll refresh it. Okay, maybe a little less. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, student, uh, now there's one more thing. So in the X inspect tool, you have this mobile like looking icon. If you click on it, the Chrome opens in a mobile mode. You can select which phone do you want. And if I refresh the page, the, f the web page is opening as if it was opening in a Pixel 2 phone. Now, as you can see, student, it's actually little bad. It's not looking good at all. So what do we do about it? There's a concept of responsive websites when we are doing CSS design. Responsive means that your website should change according to the screen in which it is being opened. To do that, you have to write separate CSS design for different screen sizes. So how do we go about it? To do that, there is something called as media queries. 
we can ju we'll just do a good Google, uh, a quick Google search about media queries. As you can see in the first example, which is from w3schools.com, this, this CSS property called media, we'll copy paste it inside our CSS file. We'll go ahead, write it, put this body tag inside of it. We'll indent it. Now, as you can see, at media only screen, it tells that this is right being written for a screen size whose max width is 600 px. This means that for screen size less than 600 px, this CSS is going to be applied. Now, uh, we'll copy paste it again and we'll write it over here as min width. Min width means that this CSS property is going to be defined or applied for all screen with pixel size greater than 600 px. So basically, uh, this will be for small laptops, so on and so forth, and this will be for your mobile phones. Now, we don't want such padding to be applied on mobile phones, so we'll make it 10px, and we'll make it 10px over here as well. We'll go back to our page, we'll close this tab. Now, we'll open it in mobile and see it's opening all fine now. Okay, as soon as we exit the mobile mode, we still have the same design with us for desktop. I hope you understand this concept, students. I'll resize the browser and show you. That will make it more clear. So we'll start resizing the browser. And at a specific size, as you can see, it is changing to this. Now you can adjust the pixel levels depending upon what you want. At this size also, I think it's not looking good. So maybe we can increase this to 800px. And this also 800px so that the, that body padding is applied to screen size greater than 800 px only. We'll refresh the web page and we'll increase it, we'll decrease it and now it changes to mobile design quite fast. So you can keep altering it to reach the number that you think will be good for your web page. Okay students, so I hope you have understand. Uh, you understand now how to use internal style sheet and external style sheet. And we have covered quite a few CSS properties as well, including padding, background color, so on and so forth. And we have also covered the hover characteristic in this class. I hope you understand all of it. If you don't, you can retake this class because it's quite important. And we have used this class to design all the HTML web pages that we have built until now. In the next class, we'll cover a very interesting topic called Bootstrap. But before that, uh, if you don't understand anything pertaining to this chapter, I request you to take it again. So, see you soon in the... Hello students. I hope you have gone through the bootstrap as it was mentioned in the last lecture. You have read about it online and you are aware of all the concepts that we have discussed in the CSS section. Today, I'll show you how to apply bootstrap in your HTML file. So, uh, this is the home page. I've designed it using bootstrap. Earlier, it was just a simple plain list, but we wanted to make our, our home page look special. So this is what I have done. Going back to the code, as you can see, I've created a div. I've made it, it the parent of all the bootstrap boxes, and I've added a class to it called as section boxes. Again, after this, I have used these div tags. So I'll just arrange it over here so you guys can clearly see. So as you can see, this first bootstrap box, it uses col sm5 tab. That is, it's going to use the first five columns. You will understand this if you have read about the bootstrap section properly. So if you haven't, please read about it online before and then come back to this lecture. Going ahead to the second div, I've added classes called col sm5 and col sm offset 2 to this div, as you can see over here. Plus, all the boxes contain one more class called section div, which is being used to apply CSS to these. Now, what colsm offset 2 does, it adds two columns before starting this box, which is placed in five columns again. So, the first box comes in five columns, then we leave two columns, and then we add this HTML box in the next five columns. So, the 12 columns in this row is completed. After that, we have added CSS effect in this section div box. I'll go ahead and show it to you in the style sheet. As you can see, we have added these many CSS effects. We have also added a hover effect on this box. 
So when you hover on it, the background color of this box is changing to green. I hope you understand this concept guys. So this is a 5 coal SM. It uses five, first 5 columns. Then we have an offset of 2 columns before this box. Then this box uses 5 columns. Again 5 columns for this box, 2 offset, 5 columns. And the bonus box contains 12 columns. So Bootstrap is very useful if we want to arrange our boxes in these manners. And you will use it a lot when you are designing your HTML pages. So I'll recommend you guys, if you don't understand any bit of the things discussed in this class, please go back and read the Bootstrap grid system once again and then come back and revisit this lecture. So I'll be adding this file and entire file project, uh, the entire project in fact, as a res in the resource section of this lecture so that you can refer it and see what you are missing and go back and learn them again. So hope to see you in the next lecture. Uh, we'll start discussing about JavaScript now and we'll add some great interactions to the web pages that we have created so far. Hello students. So till now you have covered JavaScript variables and JavaScript events. In the event you have till now understood what JavaScript events are and how they are triggered. Today we'll see an example of a JavaScript event which is known as onClick. So students, uh, before we do that, I'll give you an example of how script tag works in, on an HTML page. You must have read about it in the JavaScript variable section. So JavaScript on an HTML page is written between script tags. I'll add a script tag after the body tag on this HTML page. I'll go ahead and add a JavaScript function called alert on this page. I'll write uh, hello world inside this alert. So we use inverted commas to write a set of strings as you must have seen in the JavaScript variable section again. We'll refresh this page now, which is the JavaScript events where we have added our code. And as you can see, as soon as we open this page, we get this message, hello world. I'll zoom out so that it's proper. Yeah. I'll refresh again just to show you hello world messages coming up. So we'll very often use this alert function, students, in when you're building web pages because it's quite useful when you want to give out a give out an alert message to the user. Today what we'll do is to understand JavaScript events better, we'll give out an alert message when a user is clicking on this button. To do that, we'll use the onclick event. Onclick, as the name says, is an event which is triggered when somebody clicks that particular element. As you can see, onclick is being written as an attribute over here. So what we'll do is We'll inside the on click, we'll write the alert function and we'll write the message as somebody clicked. Now, student, because we are using inverted, double inverted commas outside, inside the alert box, I have used single inverted comma because if I use double inverted comma here, the function on click will stop here itself and an error will be thrown. We don't want to do that. You can use vice versa also. You can use single inverted commas outside and double inverted commas inside. That doesn't make a difference. Now we'll go on the page and see what happens. Just a minute, guys. Yeah. So the page has refreshed. I'll go ahead and click on click me button. And as you can see, we are getting the message somebody clicked. So this is an example of how on click event works. I hope you guys understand that. See you soon in the next chapter. Hello students, in today's class, we'll learn how to create custom JavaScript functions. So I'll go to that chapter, JavaScript functions. So first we'll learn what are JavaScript functions. Basically a JavaScript function is a piece of code which does a particular task. It is executed when the function is called. So whenever we call a particular function, it does a particular task. We'll see what that means right now. I'll come to the HTML web page of this page. Over here, we have a script tag over here after the body tag and on click event over here. So we'll go ahead inside the script tag, we'll create a custom function. So when we are creating a function, we write the word function first, give a space and then the name of the function. We'll write the function for adding two numbers. We'll give open bracket, close bracket 
and then open parenthesis and close parenthesis. We'll give an enter and inside this we'll add an alert box. Now students, whenever you want to add, uh, whenever you want to add some custom inputs to the function, you write the variable names that the function will be provided. We'll add num1, comma num2. Whenever the function is being called, this num1 and num2 is going to be provided to this function. Now, inside this function, we'll write alert num1 plus num2. If you're not writing inverted commas, then this, if, it, uh, if num1 and num2 are numbers, then both of them are going to be added and being alerted to the user. If these are not numbers, but instead they are strings, they'll be concatenated together and will be provided as a result. Okay, students. Now in the onClick function, we are going onClick attribute, we are going to add this function called add number. I'll make it add numbers. We'll give open bracket and close bracket. Now because we have to provide two numbers to this function, we'll write two comma three. Now students, we'll go ahead and see what happens on the page. So it's supposed to be what is two plus three. Again, I'll refresh the page. Yeah, I'll click on the button and you can see that we are going to get, we are getting the alert file. Okay, students, I hope you understand how do JavaScript functions work. So basically, you just call the JavaScript function name over here. If there are any variables that are to be provided to this function, we write the variables inside this separated by commas. While creating a function, we write the word function first, then space, then the name of the function, and then inside the bracket, if the function is expecting any input, we mention the inputs over here, and then whatever we need to do, whatever the task has to be completed when this function is invoked is written inside this parenthesis. Right now, we are just alerting the user about it. So, okay students, see you in next section. Hello students, welcome to the last video lecture of the JavaScript uh, section. Today we are going to read how to change HTML with JavaScript. In fact, students, this is the most critical application of JavaScript for our use cases, for which in fact we have been learning JavaScript so far. With the basics of JavaScript that we have learned up till now, we are going to apply them to change HTML, in fact to manipulate the entire HTML document. As we can read here, the most powerful application of JavaScript for our use case in this course is to use JS to manipulate HTML. You can change the properties of an element in the DOM using JavaScript. In case of changing the properties of particular elements, you need identifiers which can be ID or classes. When we want to change the HTML inside one particular element, we'll be using ID because that is unique in a document. But let's say we want to change HTML for a group of elements, we are going to use classes. Now we'll come to code file of this page and see what it looks like. So over here we have two divs. One is div with id tutorial and the other is div with id application. This div with id application is currently not displayed on the web page because its style property says display none. So this div that we are seeing over here is the div with id tutorial. Our objective is that when a user clicks on this button, this div is hidden and the div with application, id application is shown to the user. So as we can see, this button over here on click is calling the show application function, which is over here. So we'll go inside the show application function and we'll write document.get element by id. You can see e, b and i over here is in caps. Bracket open and close. Inside this we'll write the name of the id which is tutorial. We'll click on dot style dot display equal to none. Let's see what happens now. So when we click on this button, that div is now hidden. So this function is working correctly. Now I'll explain what I have done over here. So as you can see students, with document, 
the entire HTML document is being searched. Inside the HTML document, we are looking by ID of the element and we are searching for an element with ID tutorial. When we find that element, then we go into its style property by dot style and inside that style property, we are changing the display of this particular element and are setting it as none. I hope you get up till now. So we are searching the document, entire document. Then inside the document, we are looking for element with ID tutorial. When we find that element, we go inside its style attribute and we set its display as none. This is what's happening over here. Now we have to also show the div with ID application when that button is clicked. So again, we'll now look for this ID, the div with ID application and set its display as block. Now we'll go and see what happens. We'll refresh the web page. I'll click on this button. And as you can see, that div with ID application under which the para tag is written, the tutorial is now hidden, is visible. Okay. Now, under this div, there's a button which shows tutorial. On being clicked, this is calling the function show tutorial. The purpose of this is to show the div with ID tutorial again and hide the div with ID application. So let's do one thing. We'll set the div with ID tutorial as block now and the div with ID application none. Let's see what happens. We'll click on click to view application. That div is hidden and the tutorial is now hidden, is now visible. We'll again click to click here to show tutorial button and it's back again in its previous shape. So students, I hope you understand what we are doing here. When the a uh, button is being clicked, it's calling a function, and that function is changing the CSS properties of particular elements. If you want to change any other CSS property, you can just replace this display with that CSS property and mention the value for that property over here, and it will be set accordingly. So this is a very powerful application of JavaScript for our use case, and you can manipulate the design of the website based on user interaction using JavaScript with this way. So students, uh, I'll end this lecture here. I hope you now completely understand how you can use JavaScript to manipulate HTML on a particular web page. Hello students, exciting news. Today we are going to learn how to host our website online. The entire website that we have created in our journey so far in our lectures, we are going to host it online today. So students, I hope you have already um, you have already signed into your cPanel account as I have explained in my last class. So inside your cPanel account, you might find something called Online File Manager. We'll click on it. So students, based because different hosting companies have custom form of cPanels, the options might differ a little bit. You have to look for something called as File Manager inside your cPanel account and just click on it. As we can see, something of a file manager of sorts has opened up on our website. Because it's written, do not upload files here. My hosting company has already written it over here. So I'll click on htdocs folder, which is available over here. And it's mentioned that files from a website should be uploaded here. So I'll click on upload icon. I'll click on uh, upload a few files, okay. And I'm inside my folder inside which all the files for the web pages that we have created so far is located. For now, demonst for demonstration purposes, I'll just be uploading two files. So it's being uploaded right now. And it's done. So if I go, my domain name is dscourse.freesite.vip. The domain name has been provided by my hosting company only. If you want, you can buy a custom domain as well. And your hosting company will guide you how you can point your website to the custom domain name. I'll just click enter. We'll open this website. And we have to click home.html because that is the name of the document. And as you can see, students, 
on the course website, if I'm visiting home.html, this web page is opening up, which we, which we have created enough for the lectures. If I go ahead and add other folders as well, upon clicking these links, those folders will be opened as it was opening up on a laptop. So I hope you follow along and you can see that the hard work has finally paid off. The website that we have created so far is now online. So students, I hope this, uh, these lectures have been very helpful to you. And in the next uh, lecture, I'll just provide you a few points on how you can move ahead in your web developer journey. It has been really nice teaching you guys. And I hope you will take my other lectures as well, which I'll be creating in the future to help you advance in your web development skills. See you students. Bye-bye.